Thanks, Eva, for the introduction, and thanks uh, to the organizers for the invitation to speak in this nice conference. And also, thank you for putting me after that thing so I won't have to define weaves. Although I don't really have uh, weaves on the slides now, I uh, uh, regret it. So I may draw some weaves just to exemplify how to get some of the results that we have. Uh, this is joint work with Marco Castronovo, uh, Misha Gorski, and David Spire, and should be on the archive hopefully soon. So uh, I will, oh, okay. So I will tell you what I understand by a cluster variety because this is different, a bit different uh, from what Alfredo told you yesterday. And the difference is precisely this deep locus. Uh, then I will tell you some conjectures on how to uh, interpret the deep locus using some torus actions on the cluster variety. And finally, I will tell you what is known uh, basically, what the deep locus is for type AD cluster varieties and some other cluster varieties that include, that include, for example, the maximal positive strata in Grasmanian 3N. That's, well, uh, as much as we can do right now, I will tell you like what the main idea is and, and, and what are the problems uh, implementing this idea beyond this case. Okay, uh, so just I know we have heard a lot about cluster algebras, but let me just um, uh, recall these things. So the main combinatorial data is that of an ice quiver, which means just a quiver uh, that doesn't have loops and doesn't have oriented two cycles. And we declare some of the vertices to be frozen. Okay. Uh, so we have n mutable vertices and n frozen vertices. Uh, and we also, since they don't, well, at least for this, at top, they don't play any role. We may assume that there are no arrows between frozen vertices. And we can, instead of having the quiver, we can have a matrix, an n plus m times n matrix, that just tells you like how many arrows are between different um, vertices of the quiver. Since we have declared vertices here, five and six frozen, I don't need to complete this to a square matrix. I just have to remember that the last few rows are the frozen. Um, and to form the cluster algebra, besides this uh, quiver or equivalent to the so-called exchange matrix, we need uh, some variables. So a seed is the data of well, the quiver or the exchange matrix together with some algebraically independent variables. Uh, so we have uh, n frozen, sorry, n mutable and n frozen. And the main combinatorial input for cluster algebra is that of a mutation. So from this seed, we can get more and more seeds. So we can mutate both the variables and the quiver. To mutate, we have to choose a mutable direction. So k between one and n. And the mutation of that quiver, I am not uh, writing here, but it's a very explicit three-step procedure. The mutation of the variables is doing like this. So you take your initial variables, you kick out the k variable where k, is, where k is the direction where you mutate, and you add a new variable that satisfies this uh, relation with respect to the old variable. So if you want xk prime is this monomial plus this monomial divided by the original xk. Okay, so as you can see, you take out one of these variables and you replace it by a Laurent polynomial in the old variables. And you can iterate this procedure in all directions. I should say though that uh, this mutation is involutive. If you mutate in direction k and then you mutate in direction k again, you go back to the original seed. Okay. Uh, and we say that two seeds, t and t prime are mutation equivalent if one can be obtained from the other via iterated mutations. So just start mutating and mutating and mutating. And it may be, you may get a finite number of seeds. You may get an infinite number of seeds. And the definition of prominence of is that the cluster algebra is the C algebra, which is generated by all these variables that you get from the initial seed by iterated mutations. So in general, you have an infinite number of these variables. Sometimes it's just a finite number, like in many examples that we have seen. Uh, Yes, really. And 
uh, for geometric reasons, I will also put inverses of the frozen variables. Note that the frozen variables belong to each one of these uh, variables in the, of this collection of variables, and I just invert them. And this is just to, to, to make the geometry uh, a bit nicer. Okay? By definition, this cluster algebra is a subalgebra of the field of uh, rational functions in the variables x1 up to x n plus. Uh, so to give an example, so uh, Alfredo and Dapping gave the A2 example, and I'm uh, more simple-minded, so I'm going to give the A1 example, but with one person variable. So, so there is some uh, mutation to make. So I'm going to denote mutable variables by uh, dots and person variables by squares. So I have this scooter, and I start with the variables x1 and x2. So let me just put this here because it will be important in a bit. So my initial seed is just uh, x1 and x2. I mutate once. The mutation rule says that I should replace x1 with 1 plus x, uh, x2, sorry, over x1. So there is a typo here. It should be 1 plus x2 over x1. And I don't change the other variable. And I have x2. I generate an algebra with these three variables that I have here. And one can check because uh, x2 is equal to x1, x1 prime minus 1, that this algebra is just the algebra of polynomials in two variables. And then I invert this variable because I am inverting frozen variables. Uh, and well, in this example, it's, it's, it's obvious because you only meet it once. But there is this beautiful theorem of a phenomenon called the Laurent phenomenon that says that if you have any seed equivalent to your initial seed, uh, then uh, the cluster algebra, the entire cluster algebra is contained in the algebra of Laurent polynomials in the variables in that seed. Okay, so it is uh, clear when you mutate once that the result is a Laurent polynomial. And the claim here is that it doesn't matter how many times you mutate in which direction, you always get Laurent polynomials in the initial variable. So there are many cancellations that, that give you this. And because by definition, all these variables, x1 tilde up to xn plus n tilde, I already belong to the cluster algebra. Another way of expressing the Laurent phenomenon is that once you take this element, the product of the variables in this C, and you invert it, uh, then you get Laurent polynomials in these variables. Okay. Uh, geometrically, this says that if I take the common non vanishing locus of these variables, then this defines an open torus of dimension n plus n in the in spec of the cluster algebra, and I call this a cluster torus. Okay. Uh, we, which are the tori that Alfredo was talking about. And also, I should say that Alfredo yesterday and also that thing mentioned that there is an A cluster variety and an X cluster variety. I live in the A world. I'm not going to say anything about X cluster varieties. Okay. And well, my definition of the A type cluster variety is that it's just spec of the cluster. Okay. There are some technicalities here. So to make this nice, for example, I need to assume that the cluster algebra is finitely generated, which is not guaranteed because in general, you have an infinite number of variables and, and you have to, and it's not always true that the cluster algebra is finitely generated. But let's say that we live in the world where it is. And I define the cluster variety to just be spec of the cluster algebra. Then the thing that Alfredo defined yesterday is what I call the cluster manifold which is the union of all these cluster tori, okay? And the deep locus is the difference between the cluster variety and the cluster matter. And this deep locus may be not empty even in this very simple example. So in this very simple example, remember that the cluster algebra is just the algebra of polynomials in two variables. And then you invert this. Variable. So, which means that what I call the cluster variety in this case is going to be uh, the plane C2 
and then you remove a hyperbola. Okay. Now, if we look at the cluster tori, one cluster tori is given by the non-vanishing locus of x1 and x2. And here the coordinates are um, x1, x1 prime, x2 is this thing that already doesn't vanish. So if I take one cluster tori, the result is going to be the plane minus the hyperbola minus the x-axis. And for the other cluster tori, well, this is the plane minus the hyperbola minus the y-axis. And then the union misses this point, the point zero zero. So in this case, the deep locus consists of just a single. Are there any questions so far on the basic definitions? Yeah. So, call, uh, uh, basically, you, you could say that your cluster uh, variety is uh, uh, something in the closure of your torus, right? Yeah, 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 you. This stratification is fine, right? Somehow. You have some uh. sort of stratification. Uh, what do you mean by certification in this setting? I'm not sure, but... Uh, well, I mean, uh, the, there are some uh, certifications of the variety uh, called the cluster uh, as, as certifications. I don't know if, if, if these are very helpful here. What uh, you have hyperbola and the point, yeah, yeah. And, and in this case, this would be like the cluster as, as a certification. You have like a pairs. And then the line. So you certify it by a C star squared and then a C, which is in the closure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but in general, I mean, we have, we could have infinitely many cluster tori. So we have infinitely many certifications, and it's not clear which, which one is, is, is the best. Okay. Uh, at least two. Yes. Yes. Um, any other? So is this example, the focus would be a point? Yeah, a point, yeah. Yeah, which is like, uh, I take the union of this tutorial and it captures everything except, except the point, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, uh, I should also mention that uh, there is another algebra very closely related, which is called the upper cluster algebra. I am not really going to work with that, but I would, uh, I should mention it. So the upper cluster algebra here is just the intersection of all these Laurent polynomial rings, where this runs over all seats that are equivalent. And in general, this algebra A is contained, but it may not be equal to the algebra A. In all the cases that we are going to see today, this is actual inequality, so that's why I'm not making a distinction. But in general, one should talk about the A D blocks and the U D blocks. And, and somehow the difference between A and U lies in the deep looks. Uh, so, so one question is here, well, well, what can we say about the deep locus, for example, when is it not empty? Well, we can say that it's got dimension at least two. That's a general theorem. And another thing that, well, it's, it's more or less by definition is that if the cluster variety has singularities, then the singularities must lie in the deep locus. Uh, but at least to me, it's not a pretty clear what, what else should be in these D blocks. Okay. Uh, and it's not clear when it is empty or when it is not. Empty. Uh, to, to remedy this, uh, I'm going to set a conjecture. But to do that, I need to introduce some, some, object, some objects. So I'm going to fix a seed, see, or a seed, this initial seed. And I'm going to take a torus of dimension the number of variables. Okay. This torus, the tilde acts on the cluster torus, or if you want on the variables of the initial seed, just by rescaling the variables. And of course, it, it, it's unreasonable to expect that uh, this action will extend to the entire cluster algebra, because so far you're only acting in a very small part. Okay. But we can find a subtorus of this t tilde that does act on the entire cluster algebra, and we can get this as follows. So, first, we're going to consider a map 
from this torus of rank n plus m to a torus of rank n, which is given essentially by the transpose of the exchange matrix. So you send this n plus m tuple to this n tuple, where here the powers are, are given by the transpose of the exchange matrix associated to this initial. And you can do this for every uh, every seed, so you can act in every cluster torus. And it is a theorem of Gekman, Shapiro, and Weinstein that when you restrict the action to the kernel of this beta, all these actions actually glue together to form a global action on the cluster variety. Well, on the cluster algebra and therefore on the cluster variety. And this action preserves the cluster manifold, and therefore it also preserves the D blocks. Okay. Moreover, and this follows almost by definition, this torus acts freely on the cluster manifold because it is a subtorus of a torus that already acts freely on, on a cluster torus. Okay. Okay. So then we have. A necessary condition for a point to be in the deep locus. If you can find a point whose stabilizer is not trivial, then it has to be in the deep locus. Okay. I'm not saying this is easy, but at least we have a necessary condition. Sorry, a sufficient condition for a point to be in the deep locus and a conjecture by Direk Sender and David Spire is that the deep locus is precisely uh, the collection of points. With non trivial stabilizer. Yeah. Is the supervisor cannot be just discrete or it could be? I don't know, it, be. It, it, it cannot be discrete, yeah. And I, I will say, I, it's, it's unclear to me in what generality Shende, well, it's unclear to me whether it, it was Shende or Spire who made this conjecture. So I'm just attributing it to both. And it's also unclear to me in what generality they, they made this conjecture. So, so it's, it's, I, I would be doubtful if this works for all cluster algebras, but they made this conjecture at least in some generality, which is completely unclear to me. And just to, to, to say why this conjecture is a bit uh, surprising, well, take the following example, take this quiver a type A quiver with one frozen variable. So this torus T, not always, but you can sort of imagine it has the rank equal to the number of frozen variables. And so this is saying that if you can put your point in its orbit, which will be just a one dimensional torus, then you can always find this very large torus, cluster torus that contains the point. So just because the difference between the rank of a cluster torus and the rank of this torus is very big, this conjecture is to me at least surprising. Okay. The, the, the torus depends on the choice of initial suit. Uh, up to isomorphism. It's to be clear that this stabilizer is uh, the same. Like, like if you have this point in the, in the cluster, right? You can compute a stabilizer with a different torus on each C. Uh, I mean, when you have neighboring seats, the total IR isomorphic, and the stabilizers are going to go to one another. So, yeah. So, in that sense, it's enough to do it in one. Uh, so, I'm going to give some results towards this conjecture, in particular in finite type. But first, I need to restrict a bit uh, the generality in which I am going to prove this. Yes, of course. And this is why we, why I needed the, the language of the exchange matrices and not just quivers. So let's say that you have two extended exchange matrices with the same mutable part, okay? Uh, and I am going to assume that the span over the integers of the rows of B1 tilde and B2 tilde are the same. Then up to multiplying by tori, the deep loci are isomorphic. I mean, this is actually a statement of the two cluster varieties that are, they are isomorphic up to multiplying by tori, and we can check that this isomorphism like sort of preserves the deep blocks. So in particular, uh, well, not in particular, but we can also check that the, bless you, that the uh, Shen-Spire conjecture is 
true for B1 tilde if and only if it is true for B2 tilde. So in a sense, this doesn't depend too much on frozen variables. Uh, I will focus on the case where this has full rank over Z. And in this case, the torus of X is it, actually a torus of rank equal to the number of frozen variables. Okay. Um, so the lemma is true even if it's not over? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but as long as the span is the same, the lemma is. And, and, and the way to prove it is, it is like more or less standard in, in, in cluster algebra if you consider this larger. Uh, and you show that if you add a frozen variable that doesn't change the span, then you're basically just multiplying by a torus. Uh, so I'm going to restrict to this case. And the most popular, I, I would say, setting, which in this case is true, is that of so-called principal coefficients which is where you have extended, extended exchange matrix of uh, this form. So you put one frozen variable for each mutable variable, so like a shallow variable, although we don't really prove things for this because this is a bit too large. Uh, are there any? Okay, uh, and well, the first main result is that this is true in finite type. So uh, first of all, the cluster algebra has finite cluster type, meaning that there is only a finite number of cluster variables, a finite number of seats, uh, if and only if the mutable part of the quiver is mutation equivalent to an orientation of a finite type Dinkin diagram. And the first theorem, again, joint work with Marco Casanova, Misha Gorsky, and David Speyer, is, well, number one, the conjecture, the Shen Speyer conjecture, is true for cluster algebras of finite cluster type. Again, under this condition that you have a full rank over the integers, that the exchange matrix has full rank over the integers. And in this case, we can give all of the properties of these D blocks. The D block is empty when during type A even is six and E eight. Else is not empty. It is not empty, irreducible and smooth, in you, if you're in type A odd, D odd, and E seven, and in type D even, it is non-empty, non-irreducible, and non-smooth. And if you are in type D even for well six and beyond, then it is not even equidimensional. So in this case, uh, you will have three components, two of them of the same dimension and one of them larger. I will show you how how you get this. And well, I should remark that there are recent results of uh, Greg Muller and his student, uh, James, probably, Breyer, uh, who described the deep locus also in finite cluster type, but without frozen variables. And their methods are studying by realizing the cluster algebras coming from a surface. And for, techni for technical reasons, they need the surface to not have functions. And that's what says that, that you don't have person by. All methods are based on uh, having a nice geometric realization of these cluster varieties of type AD, uh, which is given by half the correlated double bot Simonson cells. I will define them in a second. But as far as I am aware, they were introduced by L. Glu and L. Glu and U about seven years ago. And it follows some general work of Gudra and Yakimov that they admit cluster structures. Although we don't really use this work, we base on work of uh, Lin Huishen and Dapin when we construct a very explicit cluster structure. Okay. And then, uh, well, using this with calculus that Dapin was talking about, we can construct many cluster tori on this what Summerson bright is enough to prove this conjecture. Okay, so let me just define what, what these uh, double bot Samuelson cells are. So just to recall, we have a flag, which is a sequence of subspaces in C to the N, uh, where the dimension of each uh, subspace is equal to its index. And two flags are said to be in position I if 
the height subspace is different, but all the other ones are the same. And we're going to denote this relation just by this arrow. And I will fix a basis of C to the N, and then I have a standard. So I take a positive grade word on, let's say, N strands. Then this half decorated double box Amazon cell is, um, well, this variety. So I have chains of flux from F0 to FL. L is equal to the number of letters in the braid word, the number of crossings in the braid. Uh, that satisfies some conditions. Number one, I start with the standard flag. If I move one step, I am going to change one subspace, and the subspace I change is given by the braid word. And finally, I require that the last flag is on this big uh, cell. Okay. B minus B plus or over B plus. And these double bot Samuelson cells are, are these double bot Samuelson cells are special cases of braid varieties. And if I have time, I will go to braid varieties and what, what we know about them. But in general, in, in my experience, braid varieties are much uh, wilder than, than double bot Samuelson cells. Uh, so this cluster structure has C full rank. So, so we are in the setting that, that we want to be. And the maximal torus in PGLN acts diagonally on this double bot Samuelson cell. So it acts on the flag variety. If you think of this as just being diagonal matrices, modular scalar matrices, and the diagonal action is not going to affect any of these conditions. Okay. And one thing that we can show is that this is precisely the torus that acts by cluster automorphisms that I introduced before. This kernel of the exchange matrix, well, the torus given by the kernel of the exchange matrix, we can realize it very, very explicitly. And well, I said that I have finite cluster type. And for that, I need to give you which braids give you this finite cluster type. So this is uh, a n minus one, there are n crossings. Uh, the, the condition here is that the cluster variables correspond to regions which are bounded and well, which are bounded on the left, I guess. And the frozen variables correspond to regions which are bounded on the left and unbounded on the right. So this is this region. And there is a way to draw the arrows that I'm not going to explain, but this is how you get type a n minus one. This is how you get a, a, a cluster variety of type D. Here you have two frozen. So we are not really working with this principal coefficients case, again, because to me it's too big, but we put, in a sense, as few frozen variables as to make this full rank. Uh, E6, you have it like this. So you have this three standard rate, uh, E7 and E8. And we have a conjecture that somehow specializes the uh, Shen the spire conjecture to this sort of double but Samuelson varieties, uh, which is as follows. So we have beta to be a positive braid, T the maximal torus in PGLN. And well, I, I, I should uh, be, be more or less honest, I guess. Uh, it may be that not every coxeter generator appears in beta. And then this torus is too large. We need a question, but I'm going to. Uh, not not worry too much about that. Uh, then the following are equivalent. Number one, there is no deep locus. Number two, these stories act freely on the double bot Samuelson. So, uh, so this one in one if and only if two is essentially the Shende spire conjecture. Uh, number three, these stories act freely only on the person variables. You only need to check that. And number four is that the braid, well, it's closure is a link in general. And we conjecture that one to three are equivalent to the braid closing up to a knot. So just one single component. And we can show that two, three, and four are equivalent. And that two implies one. And we can show that these are all equivalent for the braids above. So for these braids, 
and you can see for example that this is going to close up to a not if and only if you have an odd number of crossings and then you are in a even this never closes up to a not because you have this uh, component and e6 e8 close up to a not but not e7 uh, and we can also show for some other breaks always in three strands but this is already enough to show that if you have the maximal positron stratum in plus one and three n then it has entity blockers if and only if uh well three does not divide and this has a nice interpretation in terms of uh planar configurations so one way to think about this positive variety maybe up to some time is that uh, this consists of the configurations of endpoints in a projective complex space plane sorry uh, such that any three consecutive of them are not collinear cyclically consecutive are not collinear and this previous uh, thing that, that that we can show this for our equivalent for this maximal positive stratum implies the following that an element belongs to the deep locus if and only if you can find a non-trivial decomposition of c3 such that every point here which are lines in c3 is either containing b1 or in b2 for every i so well because three is well the only way to decompose it non-trivial is one plus two either one of these two spaces is one dimensional so let's say that you start with a point p1 and if you want this to be true then uh you choose p2 p3 not collinear p4 has to be equal to p1 because p1 and p4 are both contained well p4 is contained either in b1 or in b2 cannot be in b2 because otherwise it would be collinear with this two so it has to be p1 and then you keep choosing points but it's like three cyclic P4, P7, P10, etc. are equal to P1. And then this can only happen that we have this sort of behavior in such a way that these are cyclically non-collinear if and only if three divides them. That's a nice combinatorial exercise. Uh, and, and we conjecture that something similar is true for, for all positors, not just three end, but but the proof should be combinatorially much much harder uh, finally i should say well how do we obtain the components of these deep blockers in this case we obtaining we obtain them by essentially separating the components of the link one by one let me give you just the example of type d8 which is this right we see that it has three components and then when we separate this red component, we're going to get this braid. And then we're going to have a component of the deep locus, which is a double what Samuelson variety for this other braid. And we see that this is one, two, three, four, five, six dimensional. But when we separate, for example, the blue component, we're going to get another component of the deep locus, which is a double what Samuelson for this braid, which is only two dimensional. And when we separate the black component, we also get a two dimensional. So then we have three components. Two of them are our dimension two, and one of them is of dimension six. And in general, for example, if you have a Grassmannian three comma three n, you're going to have three components, and all of them are going to be isomorphic to the double bot sum associated to the Grassmannian two comma two n. And the conjecture is that this is true much more generally but so far we can only prove it uh, for this Grassmannians and I guess I am out of time so no weaves for for this talk thank you so uh this realization for the type c6 is already a mm -hmm. uh, does not seem to give any good reason why you could not consider e9 or a3 or yeah, yeah yeah and and yeah we we also have results for for for, for e not finite yeah, so yeah. sorry uh, 
I don't know if for any cats smoothie. Uh, Maybe simple laced, yes, but simple laced. Yeah, you can use that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but his, his pictures, you can extend as long yeah. as you yeah. Yes, but he, you use flat varieties somehow, right? Well, we use flat varieties to, to realize that the quiver, but, but, but I mean, which are finite type. And I guess these double but some of them are, are defined for arbitrary cut smoothie yeah. type. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we need to go there to go to E67, sorry, to E90, 10, e so on. Yeah. Oh, so the, the result was over for any three strand braids? Sorry? Any three strand braids? Uh, no, unfortunately, no. Uh, only these three strand braids of. of, of, of uh, only the E type? This one. Ah. So the, the idea, more or less, is to use the, the fact that the action is free to draw a whip. And we do this inductively. So we only need to draw one treble and vertex. But after that, we need to check that the action is still free. That gets very messy. The combinatorics get messy, and I don't know how to extend them beyond this. But you have to verify this does not solve all three strand Because you get two randomizers and three, and that doesn't change the right. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't think it exhausts all three strand breaks, but maybe. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and I should say, well, maybe this is only. For you, but I don't expect any of these things to be equivalent for braid varieties. Yeah. Okay, so the braid technology is it only works in simple lace? Or is there any way to extend the non-simple lace? Uh, we should be able to get non-simple lace if we work with double what Amazon sells in non-simple lace type. So, so the, there is a definition for those. Uh, I don't. I mean. We don't get these visual pictures, but we should be able to, and it shouldn't be so hard. Yeah. Is there some intuition um, behind why the number of components you get when you move the bridge is related to the torus um, action being um, Is there some intuition? I mean, if we have some formulas for how the torus acts. So first of all, these varieties are affine. And we have some formulas for how the torus acts on coordinates. And then it becomes more or less clear. I can, I can show you the details. Yeah. There's a question from Keith Holland in the chat. Uh, is there any connection between the condition that three has to divide N and Chris Brace's great group action for Gerd 3 n which only gives when three divide N? Oh, that's a great question. I, I don't know. I haven't thought about it. Okay, that's 